video lecture for microbiology. Um, the current date is November uh, 19th, 2018. This is to finish up chapter 13, and this is Brian Hooker. Um, as you may remember, we left off and we were talking about the difference between endotoxins and exotoxins. And exotoxins are actively secreted by cells, by bacterial cells, or by viruses, or other types of microorganisms. Um, and uh, just to give you a visual example, I can get my screen to cooperate here. Here's a picture of anthrax exotoxin. Uh, you can see that the eye basically has been lost here, which is really a shame. And then we talked about endotoxin. Endotoxin is essentially lipopolysaccharide that is shed from uh, gram-negative bacteria, from the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. And one of the ways to test this is to uh, subject the endotoxin to limulus crab blood. Limulus crabs are horseshoe crabs, and there's a picture of a horseshoe crab, and they actually have a different type of blood. Um, it is blue. And when they bleed the crabs, and then they take the blood and expose it to endotoxin, the blood clots. Uh, it is a really, really sensitive endotoxin test. So they have entire farms of limulus crabs, and all they do is they take the blood out of the crabs, and they use them for different products in the biotech industry to test and make sure there are no endotoxins in the product that could cause an adverse event. <coughs> um, many microbial diseases, uh, as I mentioned before, are not... Uh, uh, caused directly by endotoxins and exotoxins, but many microbial diseases are the result of um, excessive or inappropriate host response. Uh, like histamine release, uh, you're probably familiar with histamine release if you have allergies. Allergies uh, um, involve a chemical called histamine, and when histamine is released and you get watery eyes and runny nose, you can get hives and rashes. Uh, um, airway distress, things like that. And then also inflammation. Inflammation at the site of infection or systemically can be an inappropriate response and can lead to autoimmunity. Okay. Um, here's a classical case of immune system gone wild, and that is acne. Um, acne is an eruption caused by the blockage in inflammation of um, just uh, sebum in the skin as a response to a uh, different type of bacteria. Propionobacteria acnes is the primary agent that is causal to acne. It's a commensal bacteria, but the immune response has gone wild uh, and is then causing these different pustules to form. Um, the figure on the left is what's called a white head. It's a closed comedo, and the figure on the white, right is a black head, and it's an open comedo. The difference between a black head and a white head is just the black head is open, and so the, some of the components of the uh, pustule are oxidized, and it turns the top of that particular pustule black. Okay, here is Propionobacterium acnes. That's the active agent in acne. Again, it's a commensal bacteria. It just sits on your skin, but the immune system during adolescence starts to respond to this bacteria as if it's a foreign invader, and that's where acne happens. Okay, acne can be uh, very benign or it can be quite severe. Okay. Now, we should talk about the different stages of a clinical infection. Uh, this is just the different portions that uh, primary care providers will identify just to know what stage their patient is in for a particular infection. The incubation period is just the initial contact to the first symptom. So in the incubation period, uh, most, of, if not all, patients do not know that they've got a clinical infection. Uh, the agent is multiplying in the portal of entry, has not spread to become systemic yet. And so during this incubation period, there are no symptoms. <coughs> during the prodromal stage, there's just sort of malaise and head, muscle, stomach ache, 
uh, just a vague feeling of discomfort that will last one to two days. And then the period of invasion is where the disease symptoms, the disease, the symptoms that are associated with that pathogen um, are seen. And this is marked by fever and then more specific symptoms to that particular disease. And depending on the disease, it could uh, be just a few days like a rhinovirus virus, like a cold, or it could uh, last forever like HIV. And then a convalescent period, this is when the symptoms have declined and the patient starts to recover. Okay, uh, infections can be local and the barriers of the body can confine those infections just to one particular place like a boil or a dermatophyte, uh, which can exist except for one portion of the body or some type of wart. Uh, systemic infection is when the infection spreads to several sites, usually by the bloodstream. Um, this would be like AIDS or brucellosis, typhoid fever, histoplasmosis, uh, different diseases of that nature. And the bloodstream is definitely infected. And in this um, case, it's incumbent that you start to treat the disease early uh, because sepsis, which is a hospital, which is sepsis, which is a uh, blood infection, can lead to septic shock and death. A focal infection is when the uh, local infection breaks loose and is carried into other tissues, and we call that toxemia. Okay. A mixed infection is when you have several different pathogens in the same infection site. Uh, dental caries, uh, which is tooth decay, involves three different bacteria. Um, wound infections, uh, wounds are not selective for any specific species of bacteria, so you get mixed infections in wounds. Uh, primary infection is uh, the first pathogen that invades the host. And when you have a primary infection, uh, you can also initiate a secondary infection. Uh, by a different microbe, like a bacterial infection and then a yeast infection because of the antibiotics, or a viral infection which runs down the body and leads to a bacterial infection. So the primary is just first, and the secondary is merely second. Acute infections are severe, but uh, they don't last a long period of time. You get over the infections fairly quickly. A chronic infection uh, persists over a long period of time, like shingles or herpes or HIV. Okay, and here's a mixed infection. You can see that there's some uh, sort of pseudococcus there, and then there's a spiral bacteria that says it looks like a spirochete. And so you've got two different bacteria in the same infection site. Uh, this is uh, dental caries, and you can see the blue is actually bacteria that have been stained blue, and then the red blood cells are on the teeth, and those are appear obviously in red. Okay, and it's important to know the difference between a sign and a symptom. A sign is what the observer sees, and it's any type of objective evidence uh, that an observer can either see or measure. Say if you had meningitis, then they could possibly detect bacterial in the spinal fluid. That wouldn't be a symptom because you wouldn't feel the bacteria. You would feel different things, but you would have to have that analyzed and that would indeed be a sign. So the objective observer sees the signs, but the patient themselves is sensing the symptoms. Okay, these are subjective and can only be described by the patient. Uh, you can't see somebody having a headache patient has to tell you they have a headache or fatigue or nausea or malaise or chills. These are all types of symptoms. And then when you take the signs and the symptoms together, then that gives you what's called a syndrome. And that's a disease that can be identified or defined by a certain complex set of signs and symptoms. Uh, inflammation is a result of the immune system. And in the inf in inflammation, the symptoms would be fever, uh, which is also a sign. I mean, you can't objectively identify somebody having a fever just by taking their temperature, pain, soreness, and swelling. And then signs would be edema, where the tissues swell up, uh, granulomas and abscesses, where uh, the 
collection of inflammation, inflammatory cells uh, and microbes is walled off. And then lymphadenitis, which is just a fancy way to say swollen lymph nodes. Uh, and that's when the care provider is checking your lymph nodes to see if there is um, activity in the lymph nodes, which means that white blood cells are being produced in order to combat the infection. And then what we call lesions, which is the site of the infection and disease, and these lesions usually become swollen up because of inflammation. Okay, here's a very, very profound case of edema, uh, where one leg has some type of infection, the other one does not. Uh, here's an anthrax ne neck lesion. Again, anthrax produces exotoxin, uh, and the exotoxin is basically what's called a lethal factor, and it just kills cells. Uh, in terms of blood infections, depending on what the cell the uh, blood is infected, we uh, can term this as different types of infections, like leukocytosis, which is an uh, increase in white blood cells. And you know when the white blood cell goes, count goes up, the body is actively fighting an infection. Leukopenia, which means that white blood cells are dying off. Septicemia, which is just a clinical term for blood infection. It's also called sepsis. And then the immune response. Uh, antibodies to a particular pathogen will appear in the blood serum. And this forms the basis for diagnosis. So you can test the antibodies that the body is creating, and then you can figure out what disease the infection is being caused by. Um, so you can do like an HIV test. And just by looking for antibodies in the blood against uh, human immunodeficiency virus. Okay, here's an HIV antibody test. You always have a positive control. You have to have some type of control that lets you know that the test is working. And here you place the sample, which could be blood or saliva, uh, directly into the sample port or the sample well. And the test on the left is positive for HIV and the test on the right is negative for HIV. Okay, and here's another bloodborne virus called cytomegalovirus. And you see white blood cells, which are larger, red blood cells, which are smaller and they look disc-like, and then these small dots, which are actually the infective agent, that is cytomegalovirus. Those aren't platelets. Platelets are usually transparent, and very difficult to see under a microscope. Okay, and then you have to be concerned with the portal of exit of the infection because that's how the infection is going to spread to other people. So respiratory and salivary, uh, any type of cough or sneeze, which can uh, project uh, germs or pathogens into the air uh, very, very far. Uh, talking, laughing, um, this will cause droplets that will spread the infectious, infectious agent. Skin scales. Uh, shedding uh, of skin, uh, specifically for bacteria, also contact with warts, fungal infections, boils, uh, herpes, smallpox, and syphilis. Feces, and we don't uh, we don't have as much of a concern in the United States because of advances in sewage systems, uh, but. Things like diarrhea, uh, a more fluid stool can become a public health problem, especially if you have uh, feces that are in the water supply or in direct contact with humans. And then the urogenital tract, uh, vaginal discharge or semen through sexual contact, uh, and less frequently urine. Urine can be infected if you have a bladder infection or a UTI, but it's less frequent that people actually do come into contact with urine. Okay, blood or bleeding. This is where uh, transfusions, uh, sexual contact, shared needles uh, can come into play. Okay, and here's a typical sneeze. You can see if you take a time-lapse photograph of a sneeze, it's actually quite dramatic and you're getting a lot of droplets spread. Those droplets will get onto surfaces, bacteria and viruses will live for a short amount of time on those surfaces and that can cause spread of disease. Uh, here's the H1N1 virus. That's a type of influenza, uh, swine flu. Uh, there was a swine flu scare in 2008 and 2009 
uh, where several people uh, in the United States got the swine flu and this was transmitted, could be transmitted orally. Uh, here's somebody that has herpes simplex 1. It's a simple cold sore. And so this is a skin infection and it can be tr transmitted through direct skin to skin contact. So when you look at the host, a host is a really great place for microbes to grow. We are big Petri dishes. However, we do have host defenses that you just find they're unique in nature. Um, so if you look at the persistence of microbes, the first stage is latency. And that's just a dormant stage after the initial onset of symptoms. And there are a lot of, uh, especially viruses that can go dormant after the first uh, sign of symptoms, uh, like the herpes virus, the shingles virus, hepatitis B, uh, HIV AIDS, and Epstein-Barr will all become latent. They become latent viruses. Uh, some are retroviruses, so they can integrate directly into the genome. Some are just merely latent viruses, and they'll go latent and stay in the cytoplasm of cells. Also, long-term damage has to be considered uh, when microbes are persistent in the host. Uh, meningitis can lead to deafness. Strep throat uh, can lead to rheumatic heart disease, and Lyme disease can lead to arthritis. So the long-term damage um, of these particular disorders can be rather profound, and so it's important to treat disease. Okay. And then you have to look at where the pathogen resides, the primary habitat where the, from where the pathogen originates. Um, the infection source is where the infection is actually acquired. And then you have carriers, and these are individuals that inconspicuously shelter a pathogen. Somebody who is sick is not a carrier. Uh, they can spread the disease, but a carrier is somebody that you, is a, a host, uh, typically a person, that has the disease but's asymptomatic, okay? And so an asymptomatic carrier has no symptoms. If they're incubating, uh, the host may feel sick, uh, but they're still going to school or work or whatever, so they're spreading the disease. Could be that they're convalescing and they uh, have gone back to work or school early uh, when they shouldn't have. And uh, then there are uh, individuals that are chronic carriers who will shelter the pathogen for a long period in, during recovery. And then there are people who are healthy carriers uh, that have just adapted to have that microbe in their system and they're asymptomatic. Uh, I happen to be a staph carrier. I have Staphylococcus aureus on my skin and it does not raise an infective response unless it gets into a wound. And so I can pass along Staphylococcus aureus to other individuals just by touch. Now, that's generally not a problem, and about 40% of the population carries Staph on their skin. Um, it's a problem, however, when there's poor hand washing practices, uh, when the Staph gets into a wound bed, because then it automatically is infected. Uh, animals can be vectors. And these just transmit the infectious agent from one host to another. Uh, could be an insect like a mosquito, could be a mammal, uh, could be a rabid dog or another rabid animal that spreads the infection through bites. There are infections you can get from birds, also in lizards. Uh, and so by biting or aerosol formation or even through touch, then the infectious agent can spread. Uh, contact with feces. Uh, if you're cleaning out your garage and you come, you see mouse feces, you should wear a mask because these mouse feces can carry hantavirus. Mice are great vectors for hantavirus, and hantavirus can get you very sick. Uh, a me mechanical vector would be like a fly, um, and they're not infected with the pathogen. It's not systemic. It's not in their body. Uh, but it's they're carrying it on the surface of their body and like flies that feed on decaying garbage or feces that land on your food. And then zoonotic infections are infections that actually transmit from vertebrate animals to humans uh, and by close association of animals and humans then the, these diseases can spread. <clears throat> 
And there's lots of different zoonotic infections. Certainly you don't have to know all of these for the exam, but I want to give you an idea of uh, some of these infections. Even MRSA can be transmitted from animals to humans. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus is not selective. It loves tissue. It loves mammalian tissue, and so it can be spread. And here are some examples of different types of infections. Uh, you've got uh, bacterial infections on top, um, and then viral infections, including uh, things like Ebola, which is in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, Non-living reservoirs would include things like soil. Uh, soil is a great place for bacteria and protozoa, also in helminths, uh, as well as fungi. Water, uh, water can carry lots of different species. The biggies that we see are Legionella, which causes Legionnaire's disease, which can lead to pneumonia. Cryptosporidium and Giardia are intestinal diseases that you get from untreated water. Cryptosporidium can be long-term, whereas Giardia is usually a short-term disease. And then when we're looking at diseases, uh, a lot of times you hear the term communicable. A communicable disease means that the infective host can transmit the disease. So if the infected host is in the population, then that disease can spread. A non-communicable disease, however, is when a person is infected by their own microbiota, either because their uh, normal flora is out of check uh, with a yeast infection or you have uh, infected bacteria that get into the wrong portal, uh, like Staphylococcus aureus in an open wound. Uh, they have the disease, they cannot transmit the disease. Okay, if you look at patterns of transmission, this is a good slide. Uh, it shows uh, direct contact droplets by talking, sneezing, vertical from uh, mother to unborn child, or different vectors, which could be a uh, infective vector or a mechanical vector. Also indirect, um, we touch a lot of surfaces. We touch a lot of common surfaces like doorknobs or cell phones or uh, handles, uh, save like the handle for uh, turning on and on the faucet uh, um, in the bathroom. Um, all of these considered fomites, and so sh you should frequently hand wash. Um, food needs to be properly cooked. Uh, water needs to be properly treated. And then you can get, um, pick up aerosols from the air, uh, from dust, from smoke and smog. Uh, this is how disease can transmit. Now, a lot of infections will be harbored in hospitals um, because hospitals have sick people. And so it's not really necessarily the hospital's fault. Uh, but up to 20% of all admitted patients will obtain some type of infection while they're in the hospital. This is an infection that they acquire in the hospital. It's not something that they showed up with in order to be treated. The average, uh, national average, is about 5%. So 1 in 20 people will get a nosocomial infection while they're in a hospital. And this is just because a hospital is a collection point of pathogens. Disease people, people with communicable diseases, go to hospitals. And so this can be a problem. Uh, hospitals also attract compromised patients. Um, who, when exposed to infectious agents, will more easily get the disease. This would be elderly, pregnant women, uh, people are run down who are taking different treatments like chemotherapy that expose them to different pathogens. Reusable instruments uh, need to be thoroughly sterilized. Uh, indwelling devices are usually not as good as the human body. Uh, even metal devices like an artificial hip or an artificial knee are not as good as the human body at fighting off infection because these devices don't have an immune system. So often they're um, collection points for pathogens and you'll get somebody that has an artificial hip or an artificial knee and you'll open them up and you'll see that, that metal actually covered with a bacterial biofilm. 
Uh, most common infections, urinary tract because of uh, improper catheterization, respiratory tract infections uh, just by inhaling, and then surgical incisions. So a lot of times with surgical incisions, then the patient will get a prophylactic antibiotic. Uh, here's a foot infection. This is uh, something that you can just get from soil, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Same as the bacteria that we use in the lab. It is a pathogen and it can become infective. Uh, here's a hospital acquired infection. This is uh, typical of somebody that has not gotten their flora replaced and they have an overgrowth of bacteria called Clostridium difficile and it forms in these little pus pockets, these little pyogenic pockets here. And this is pretty typical of somebody that has uh, had like chronic inflammation in their bowel due to Crohn's disease um, and a disruption of their normal flora. Uh, universal healthcare precautions, uh, barriers are really important using masks and gloves. Uh, you have to be very, very careful with sharps. Uh, dental hand pieces have to be fully sterilized, steam sterilized between patients. You can't just rinse them with bleach. Uh, hand contamination, so frequent hand washing. Uh, a lot of mouth-to-mouth -mouth recession kits or CPR kits now have barriers uh, that will protect and prevent disease spread during mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Uh, sick health care workers need to go home. Uh, they shouldn't stick around because they're working with compromised patients. Uh, pregnant healthcare workers have to be very, very careful and may be reassigned during pregnancy. Um, now, we talked briefly about Cox postulates before, and Cox postulates are just a set of uh, uh, standards, a set of steps that you can go through to determine whether an infectious agent is actually causing a particular disease. So uh, this is based on the germ theory of disease. So Koch did call on Pasteur. And first you find evidence of the microbe or the microbes associated with the disease. So you do a culture. You do a swab, a throat culture, um, a skin culture. Uh, uh, you take blood and look for bacteria in the blood or microbes in the blood. Uh, you isolate and then you culture the microbe. And then you inoculate a healthy individual, uh, an animal, with this particular microbe and you view the disease and see if the disease symptoms are the same as the initial disease. And then you re-isolate, you see if the same agent is actually propagating in the host. And if all this can comes into fruition, if you see the same disease state and they're um, cultivating the same pathogen, then that gives you a good idea that that particular pathogen is causing that particular disease. Okay, we can also use epidemiology, uh, even on a local scale, in order to diagnose disease and study populations of, uh, of disease. Uh, and there's a lot of disease surveillance that happens at the local level at the public health department or even at doctor's offices where they collect and analyze and report data on the rates of occurrence, the mortality, the death rate, the morbidity, the sickness rate, and then the transmission. Uh, reportable diseases, uh, things like measles or swine flu or different types of influenza have to be reported to the health department. And so if a pediatrician or a physician or a medical practitioner uh, sees a reported, reportable disease, and they'll call the health department and let them know that some a disease has been identified. Then the health department can investigate further and actually make confirm the diagnosis. So prevalence uh, in epidemiology is the total number of cases respect with respect to the total population. So the prevalence, um, we just take the total number of cases in the numerator the total number of persons in the population in the denominator, and we multiply it by 100%. So if we look at swine flu during 2008, 2009, there were only 109 cases of swine flu in the United States. So the disease prevalence among the whole population was quite low. When we look at incidence, 
Incidence is only the number of cases that we see in the total number of susceptible people. If this is the disease in infancy, then we only count infants. So say, for example, we see uh, 2,200 cases of a particular disease in a million people, then we would report that incidence as 0 0.0022. Okay. We also have to look at some definitions in epidemiology. Some of these will be on the exam, so make sure you study these. Uh, the mortality rate, that's the total number of deaths in a population due to a certain disease. Morbidity rate, the number of people who are actually infected who show signs of the disease. Endemic, that's a disease with a steady frequency. It's something that um, you see in a particular population at a steady frequency over long periods of time. Uh, like pinworms in California, not necessarily Northern California, like they like warmer climates like Southern California. And so if you look at prevalence of pinworms in school children in California, this is uh, due to poor hygiene practices in children where there's a fecal oral route. And it, uh, about 21% of the children in, in California have been infected at one point in their life with pinworms. So we call that endemic because we see it all the time. Uh, sporadic, uh, just occasional cases reported, regular intervals like tetanus and diphtheria, there are usually less than 10 cases in the United States uh, every year. And then epidemic is when the prevalence of the disease increases beyond what is expected or what is considered normal. Uh, we're currently uh, seeing epidemic proportions of chlamydia, not necessarily gonorrhea, um, but chlamydia is at a higher rate than what we would expect in a population, and so it's considered an epidemic. A pandemic is just an epidemic that spreads over multiple continents, so if somebody has a particular disease, uh, like the swine flu epidemic of 2008, uh, and they travel to a different continent and they spread that disease, then it becomes a pandemic. Okay, and here's the swine flu map from 2008. You can see it was indeed a pandemic because you had multiple cases uh, much higher than the expected incidence in multiple continents. Okay, and that concludes chapter 13. And I think what I'll do. In this particular case, let's see how long I've gone. I've only gone about 32 minutes. Think, think, think. Eh, I'll just go ahead and cover a little bit of chapter 14 on this video lecture. Just a little bit. Okay, I want to get to this. This is juicy, good material. So uh, we're starting to get into immunology in chapters 14 and 15. And so first I want to give an overview of immunology, and then in chapter 14 we'll talk about nonspecific defenses that are mounted for any type of pathogen. Okay, so our objectives here are to uh, look at the defense mechanisms of the host, define the three lines of defense, and then summarize the different systems involved in immune defenses. Okay, and we'll focus in on the second line of defense, which is nonspecific immunity. In chapter 13, we really focused on the first line of defense, which is just uh, chemical and physical and genetic components. We haven't talked too much about genetic components, but here uh, in chapter 14, we'll focus primarily on the immune system, but nonspecific immunity. Okay, so if we look at um, host defenses, they're quite complex. Uh, this is a different slide, and it's very uh, busy, but it has lots of good information. So you have uh, innate immunity, and you have acquired immunity, which is the third line of defense. In innate immunity, you have the first line and the second line of defense. The first line of defense consists of physical barriers, chemical barriers, and genetic components. The second line of defense is a cellular and chemical system that comprises the immune system that um, does not uh, is does not acquire any or does not require any type of uh, acclimation to the pathogen. These are inflammatory responses, interferons, uh, 
phagocytosis from macrophages and monocytes, and then complement activation. And then finally, we'll discuss the third line of defense in chapter 15, where uh, these are naturally acquired or can be artificially acquired. And these are B cells and T cells, uh, also accessory cells and cytokines that uh, will first identify an infection, a type of infection, and then mount a response that's specific to that particular pathogen. Okay, so this is a good slide for definitions. This is anatomical and physical barriers in the first line of defense. Um, they keep microbes from penetrating a sterile compartment. And in the first line of defense, you're looking at physical barriers, chemical barriers, and genetic components. In second line of defense, you're looking at an internalized system of protective cells and fluids. These are immune cells that mediate inflammation and phagocytosis. And then the third line of defense is acquired. It is not innate and um, it's individualized. So my third line of defense may protect me from different pathogens than your third line of defense. Okay, so if we look at physical barriers, we have skin. Skin is super wonderful. We would really be dead without it. Uh, this compo is composed of uh, epithelial cells. And the epithelial cells at the outermost layers of skin are dead. They're impregnated with keratin, and they're just providing a barrier function. Uh, and outer layers of skin are constantly sloughed off. Skin is always replenishing itself, and that carries microbes away from the body. And the hair follicles, hair is continually falling out, regrowing. That's called desquamation. And as the uh, follicles, uh, the hair falls out in the shaft, that also carries bacteria. And then sweat glands, uh, which include antimicrobial chemicals, acids, things of that nature, will kill microbes and also flush them away. Okay, mucous membranes. You find mucous membranes in the digestive tract, the urinary tract, the respiratory tract, and in the eye. And uh, the mucus coat on some bacteria impede, or some membranes impedes the attachment of bacteria. So mucus acts like a slime layer, and so the bacteria are washed away. Uh, your eye, if it becomes infected, can blink and tear. Saliva uh, carries. Um, micro microbes into the harsh environment of the stomach, and saliva itself is antimicrobial. Then vomiting, and in the hospital, vomiting is called emesis, and also defecation can get rid of microbes from your system. Okay, your respiratory tract is covered with cilia, um, and that include nasal hair and also uh, ciliated epithelium in your respiratory tree and your lungs, and then mucus and fluids associated with infection. So if you get an infection, then your production of mucus and different fluids, tearing, uh, coughing, sneezing, is basically to get rid of that particular infection, to force it out of the body. Uh, genital urinary tract, uh, continuous flow of ur urine flow through ureters and through periodic bladder flushing. Uh, like I said earlier, it's not good to get dehydrated. That can promote uh, uh, urinary tract infections. So it's good to stay hydrated so your bladder and your urethra are continually flushed. Also, vaginal secretions are antimicrobial and they can prevent microbe growth. Okay, so if we look at the first line of defense, we have saliva and tears, we have skin, we have mucus that lines the mucous membranes, we have good gut bacteria that forces out the bad, we also have stomach acid, and the low pH kills harmful bacteria before it enters into your intestines. Also, resident microbiota can block access to pathogens. Okay, uh, basically they form a biofilm on epithelial surfaces. So your good bacteria are preventing bad bacteria from attaching to these surfaces. They also can secrete chemicals that are uh, anti-pathogen. And so there's sort of bacteria to bacteria defense in this case. 
And the commensal bacteria in your gut, um, I don't like the term commensal because some are symbiotic, but these are your normal flora. And they will train your host defenses. Um, your, the, the host, the body, recognizes these as foreign, but it can't invade these. And, but it will keep the commensals in check. It doesn't want the commensals to grow in a runaway fashion, and it can eliminate pathogens. You have to be very, very careful because antibiotics can kill off your normal flora and interrupt this process. And that's when overuse of antibiotics leads to things like yeast infections or Clostridium difficile um, because the commensal bacteria or the normal flora are important to keep pathogens from taking hold. Uh, chemical defenses. Uh, are, we term these nonspecific because they don't care what the pathogen is. They will work on just about any pathogen. So antimicrobial secretions from sebaceous glands, these are just sweat glands and myobium, uh, myo, mybomian, excuse me, mybomian glands of the eyeballs, eyelids. Uh, lysozyme is an enzyme in tears and saliva that dissolves away the bacterial cell wall. Sweat. Skin has an as acidic pH and a high fatty acid content. Fatty acids can be antimicrobials. The stomach contains hydrochloric acid. And the intestines have digestive juices and bile. Bile will actually dissolve certain types of bacteria. And then antimicrobials in semen and the acidic pH of the vagina keep different bacteria and other microbes that could be pathogenic in check. Okay, in terms of genetic differences, uh, we term, have a term called genetic immunity, and there are certain things that genetically are just incompatible um, to the human host. So they might infect dogs, uh, they might infect birds. Uh, humans don't get distemper, dogs do, because genetically distemper is incompatible with the human host. There are zoonotic infections, however, that can circumvent genetic immunity, like anthrax or rabies or uh, H1N1 flu or even bird flu. Um, and but there, you do need to recognize that the just because of genetic differences between humans and other hosts, we get different diseases, and different diseases only have access to our genetic immunity, whereas other diseases will just pass us by and look for another host. Okay, so let's review. So the three lines of defense, host defense, are first our physical component. Second, or I'm sorry, first line of defense is, the first line of defense is actually three things. And I wanna be clear on that. So the first line of defense is physical components, chemical components, and genetic barriers. That those three things are the first line. The second line of defense is your innate immunity, which includes uh, immune cells and immune chemicals, which are nonspecific to pathogens. And then your third line of defense is acquired immunity that you get primarily from T cells and B cells in the immune system. Okay, so we have first, second, and third lines of defense. Uh, the three components of the first line of defense are physical barriers, chemical barriers, and genetic components. And the four physical barriers, and there, there are more than four, but four of them could be like skin, uh, could be saliva, could be stomach acid, um, it could be harsh pH in the genital urinary tract. Uh, there are, uh, could be uh, lining on the mucous membranes. Okay, so there are many, many things that we can put in here. I was just asking for four. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to conclude this video lecture, and we'll pick up there on Tuesday, which is actually tomorrow, and I need to get this video lecture posted.